I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. And now, Pastor John Carter gives us a look into the future. We give you a terrific welcome today to the Carter Report. We're going to have today a prophetic look into the future. Did you know this? Every person who's ever lived in the history of the world is going to live again. Amazing concept. Some people say, when I die, hey, that's the end of me. No, no. The Word of God teaches that every person is going to live again. And the Bible also teaches that God one day is going to have a brand new, wonderful, perfect world. We're going to talk about that today. Our topic today is the millennium. Now, the word millennium is not found in the Bible. It comes from, comes from the Latin. I'm sure most of you folks know this. The word is not found in the Bible, millennium, but milli is the Latin word for a thousand, and annus means a year. So the word millennium simply means a thousand years. The Bible says that the devil is bound with a great chain in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Let me just say a little bit about Latin. Latin was the language of the ancient Romans, and what a great language, and the language of the Roman Catholic Church, who got it from the Romans. A Latino is one who uses a language derived from Latin. For instance, the Italians and the, the Spanish and the Portuguese, and especially Central and South America. All Roman Catholic countries, they got it, of course, from the Roman Catholic Church, and they got it from the Romans. Also, Latin, to a lesser extent, contributed to the English language. So English people are not really Latinos, <laughs> but some of their words come from the Latin. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and we're going to use this book a great deal today because we believe the power is in the Word of God. Would you come to Revelation chapter 20? And this is the chapter, there's a whole chapter in the Bible on the millennium. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 and 2. Have you folks got it? I want you to turn it up in the scriptures. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. That's the abusos, this place of desolation. A great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil, and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. So let's just have a little look at this, and we're going to put this up on the screen. We've got a time period of a thousand years, and the Bible tells us that during the thousand years that the devil is bound and he's thrown into the bottomless pit. Now, the next verse, and then we're going to have the diagram. Verse 3, Revelation 20, verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, just want you to see it on the screen. The Bible tells us that you got this time period, it's, it's a thousand years. And after the thousand years, the Bible says, Satan, who has been bound with a tremendous chain, is released. And the Bible tells us that he's bound and he's cast into the bottomless pit. Uh, this is one of the most amazing truths that you're ever going to hear in your life. Uh, let's ask this question before we go any farther today. Is Satan a, a real person? 
I can understand cynics saying we don't believe in the devil because you Christians believe that he's sort of a demon being and he's got uh, horns and he's got a, a spiked tail and, and all of this stuff. Well, of course, the Bible doesn't teach this. The Bible teaches that Satan or the devil is a fallen angel and he's a person of extraordinary capability, a person of immense beauty. The most charming person you could ever meet would be Lucifer, this fallen angel. Now, in some of my lectures, you've heard when I talk on astronomy, uh, and, and I love the story of astronomy, but scientists know about dark matter and dark energy. To this point of time, Nobody knows what it is. When you look out into the universe, when you see the pictures of the galaxies and uh, the stars, the trillions and trillions of, of blazing suns and the billions and billions of, of vast galaxies, that is less than 5% of what is really there because most of what is really there cannot be seen. Nobody knows to this point of time, maybe they'll discover it one day, but to this point of time, nobody has got a clue what this dark matter is or the dark energy that actually drives the expansion of the universe that makes life on Earth possible. But there is a substance that cannot be seen. We know it is there, but we cannot analyze it, we cannot touch it, and we cannot see it. To me at least, it makes the idea of a being whom we cannot see and who exists in another realm exceedingly possible. And so here you have a being who is a, a fallen angel with an immense brain, not a brain such as we have, but tremendous intelligence, and he is a spirit being, and he is the originator of everything evil in the world and in the universe. Listen carefully. Revelation 20 describes the fate of the human race. So I'm interested in this. What's going to happen to the human race? It talks about two resurrections. This is astounding because the Bible teaches that every person is going to live again. And if you and I never meet again, one day we're going to meet again because there are two resurrections. There's a resurrection for the righteous and there's a resurrection for the wicked in the world. And the Bible teaches that one day there's going to be a tremendous battle, the greatest battle in the history of the universe. And every person who has ever lived, every person who has breathed God's beautiful oxygen is going to live again. And at the at the end of everything, God is going to create a brand new cosmos. Now the question is, when does this thousand year period, when does the millennium take place? Look at Revelation 20 and verses 4 and 5, dear hearts and gentle people. Revelation 20 verse 4 and 5, and I saw thrones and they sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. So these are the saints, these are God's people. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness for Jesus, to, to Jesus, and for the word of God. So we're talking here about the good people, the saints, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Then it says, and they lived. Hey, look at me. These are people who died. These are people who were put to death. And they lived. In other words, they were resurrected. Other translations say they came to life again. And so you've got here all the saints of God who were put to death. And it says, and they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But notice this now. This is tremendously important. But the rest of the dead, who would the rest of the dead be? The righteous are raised and they reign with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead, it's the wicked. The wicked lived not again. They did not live until the thousand years were finished. And then going back, it says, this is the first resurrection. So 
If we can establish this truth, everything starts to get plain. If you can get this, if we can get this down into the molecules of our minds, this great time period of the thousand years starts with a resurrection. And it closes with a resurrection. If you remember nothing else, remember this. The millennium starts with a resurrection. And it closes with a resurrection. And the resurrection uh, that it closes with is the resurrection of the wicked. But it starts with a resurrection. And the Bible says, blessed and holy. It starts with the resurrection of the saved. Look, please, at verse 6. This is plain. Verse 6 says, blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. I want to be in the first resurrection. What about you? Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. So some people are going to die twice. The Bible teaches unless we are born twice, we are going to die twice. The Bible says over such... The second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him for a thousand years. Now listen, please stay with me. The Bible teaches that this great time period when Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit, it commences with the resurrection of the righteous. And it closes with the resurrection of the wicked. Everybody watching on television, I've got news for you. As I've got news for the people sitting here in our studio in Southern California. If we don't come up in this resurrection, we are going to come up in this resurrection. Because the Bible teaches that every person who has ever lived is going to be raised. Nobody can escape the resurrection because we have an appointment. Let me give you just a little aside. Why I believe in the resurrection. I believe in life everlasting. I believe in the resurrection. Why do I believe in the resurrection? I believe in the resurrection because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I heard a young man, a young pastor, ask the question, why do you believe in the resurrection? He was at a great youth congress here in the United States of America. There must have been 20,000 youth leaders, and they had him up the front. He was their leader. Why do you believe in the resurrection? He said, I believe in the resurrection because of my faith. When a person says that, it is little wonder that skeptics laugh at us. I don't believe in the resurrection because of blind faith. I believe in the resurrection because it happened. I believe that faith must rest on evidence. You see. I do not believe in a blind faith. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, I would not believe it, you see. Let me give you some evidence. The resurrection of Christ is recorded in genuine historical documents. How many? Hundreds, 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 hundreds. Documents written in the Greek language, written by many, many people who testified that they saw Christ uh, rise from the dead. And here's the second piece of evidence. I could give you much more, but we don't have time. There was no dead body of Christ ever found. I want you to think about this. Whatever happened to the body of Christ, Christ was dead. He was cold. He was limp. He'd been crucified. And Christ, the Bible says, was stone cold dead. And then a little later, there was no dead body of Christ found. Whatever happened to it? 
Well, the rumor was that the disciples had come and got the body and had stolen the body of Christ. I can't buy it. How could a dozen dispirited, broken men and a few women storm the tomb that was guarded by a bunch of Roman soldiers? Can't believe that. Others have said, well, if the disciples didn't get the body of Christ, then the Jews got the body of Christ. Then why didn't they produce it? When the apostles started to preach the resurrection of Christ, the best way to destroy the church was to say, well, look at this. The dead body of Christ. So I can't buy this. And then the third possibility is that the Romans got the body of Christ somehow. But they wanted the Christian church destroyed as much as the Jewish people. And the best way to destroy the Christian church and the faith that burns in our hearts today is to say, here is the dead body of Christ. But no dead body of Christ was produced. You know why? Because there was no dead body. The body had been raised from the dead. You see. So I believe in the resurrection of Christ, not because of blind faith, as my young friend said. I believe in the resurrection of Christ because it happened. It is an historical fact. Some years ago, firstly in 1971, as a young man, I went to Moscow and saw the body of Lenin. I went into the mausoleum and joined a big crowd of Russians, saw him there cold, dead and waxy. I went back in 1991 when communism was collapsing and there he was again. It was my privilege later on to speak to literally millions of Russians and I told them this, the church is alive today in Russia because the church is built upon a living Christ. But communism has collapsed in Russia in the old Soviet Union because it was built upon a dead man, you see. So on the basis of the evidence, not on the basis of warm, fuzzy feelings, I believe in the resurrection. So come back with me to the topic of today, the millennium. We are told that the millennium starts with a resurrection. The Bible tells us it is the resurrection of the righteous. Are you with me? Am I making this plain? Well, come with me now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and uh, verse 16, my friends. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, and the apostle Paul says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The righteous are raised when Jesus returns. And so when Jesus comes back in glory and fiery splendor, the Bible tells us that the righteous, all the saints, are raised. If this is so, then the millennium that commences with the resurrection of the righteous that takes place at the second coming, the millennium takes place when Jesus returns. So there it is. It hasn't started yet, but the millennium commences when Christ returns. Come over here with me, please, to Revelation chapter 20 and verses 5 and 6. Dear hearts and gentle people, Revelation 20, 5 and 6. But the rest of the dead, the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Then a parenthesis. This is the first resurrection. Then it says six verse. Blessed and holy is he who is part in uh, the first uh, resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. 
but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. Listen, my friend. I say it again, and every person here needs to listen up. If we don't come up in the resurrection of the righteous, we are going to come up in the resurrection of the wicked. And we can say, I just don't, I just don't, it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. This is the word of God. Many years ago in Germany, there was a famous atheist. And when he died, because of his hatred to God and because he wouldn't believe in the afterlife, he said, when I die, I die, and even God Almighty will not get me out of this tomb. When he died, a little acorn fell somehow into the tomb. And water got into the tomb. And it started to grow. And if you go to that tomb today, the tomb has been burst asunder as every tomb in this world one day is going to break asunder. You see? And so there are two resurrections. And if you don't come up in one, you are certainly going to come up in the next one, the second one. And they're a thousand years apart. And during the millennium, the devil is cast into the bottomless pit. Now notice with me, please, the events during the millennium. We've noticed the events at the start of the millennium, now during the millennium. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17, the word of the Lord. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. This is our Lord's return. With the voice of an archangel, loud. And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's the first resurrection. Then we who are alive and remain, the living saints, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The Bible tells me that the sleeping saints are resurrected. And the Bible teaches that the living saints are translated and they're caught up to glory and they go to be with Christ for a thousand years. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get very tired of this old world. But one day, my friend, I'm going to be with Jesus in paradise. You see, we're going home one day to glory. And the Bible teaches that during the millennium, listen to this, during the millennium, the wicked remain on this earth as corpses. Look at Revelation 20. And verse 5, dear hearts and gentle people, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5, but the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And then if you come to the Old Testament, please come over here to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 32 and 33. Jeremiah 25 and verse 32 and 33, and I'm reading it out of the scriptures. The Bible says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Would you like to know why nobody buries them? Because nobody is on the earth who's alive except the devil and his evil angels because the saints have been taken home uh, to glory. Would you come now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 to 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 to 9, my dear friends. 
and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Glory. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished, the Bible says, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now listen to me. When Jesus comes back, he comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. He doesn't come back as gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He comes back as King of kings, Lord of Lords, the King of the universe. And when he comes back with all his power, he raises his saints and he takes them home to glory. It does make a difference. And the Bible tells me that the wicked are destroyed and remain on this earth. The question is, you've got to ask, where do I plan to spend the millennium? And there'll be more coming up soon. Time. It takes only a minute to have eternal life. How can you get saved in a minute? It's simple. First, believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Second, accept his free gift of eternal life and then you're saved. It's not hard, it doesn't take any time. You can be saved in a minute right now. Pray with me, Lord God, I realize that I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. I accept that your son Jesus Christ died for me. I ask Jesus into my heart. If you prayed this prayer, you are saved. The next thing to do is tell someone, fellowship with other followers of Jesus, get baptized, Read your Bible and pray. Choices. We make them every day, all day. The most important choice you will make in your life is whether to choose eternal life or let it pass you by. If you'd like more information about your new life, call the number and visit our website. The Antichrist is in the temple of God. I will read you the actual words of the great Roman Catholic Church. More than a billion people pray to the dead. But the Bible talks very plainly about good angels and bad angels. Why on earth were you and I born? This DVD series from John Carter will be yours with a gift of $50 U.S. or $70 Australian. Write to us at the address on the screen. Visit carterreport.org, your home for inspirational teaching. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.